Hello again, my gentle and modern apes, and welcome back to this channel. I bet you didn't think you were going to get this much Gutsy Gibbon content in one week. If this does indeed go long, which, considering the content we're about to go through, it very well might, you could get six hours of, of this in one week. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> so today, we're going to be going through some sort of leftover content by the Standing for Truth channel before I kind of likely, depending on their response to my upcoming video, which should be tomorrow, depending on when you're getting this, but before I kind of wash my hands of, of that gang in general, we don't want to leave any loose ends. So we're going to go ahead and go through some of the uh, residuals, if you will, of their content library. And that's going to be a lot of human evolution, a lot of paleontology. Now, interestingly enough, while the content amount is high, the actual substance is indeed very thin. So grab yourself a hot drink, because we're probably going to be here a while, which you you lovely, loyal fans, you, you greedy, greedy, modern apes. You, you seem to like this kind of content and this kind of content style, which makes me feel great um, in just so many ways. I, I so appreciate your, your su continued support and encouragement. So let's reward that with some, you get to watch me suffer and then suffer secondhand because as you know, when I review content, I want to represent said content in the most honest way possible, which is why we will be going through it live together. Some of which, of this content rather, I have seen, some I haven't. Again, I usually put it on while I'm like walking and running, use it as, uh, use it as jet fuel to get my good times because I get so angry, it gets my blood pumping. Um, so some I've seen, some I haven't. I don't 100% remember what I have and haven't seen. You'll see why in a second. Uh, the, Spoiler is that there's just a lot of content to cover, so we will go ahead and just kind of go through it all. We'll do it on double speed so you don't have to, um, so neither of us waste too much of our time. Hopefully, you know, we'll at least be cutting it in half, and we'll still probably be here for three hours. <laughs> you know, it's a little bit overkill, but what are you going to do? What are you going to do? So again, yes, get yourself something hot to drink. It's a very thunderstormy afternoon slash evening where I am. And, um, you know, it's it's a nice comfort to have the, the heat in your hands as we sort of um, enrage ourselves intentionally. So please find a comfortable location and let's get started. I forgot to say, like, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell. Hit the bell, that's it. Hit the bell if you want more of this style of content. Um, when you subscribe to my channel and like and interact with the algorithm, it, it makes this eldritch deity very happy. And that rewards me with suggesting my video and helps generate traffic to the channel. So, so please do engage. I, I do appreciate that more than you know. You can also support me on Patreon if you're like loaded with money and you just want to support small creators like me uh, who have no money. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm certainly doing uh, all right for myself right now, but I do appreciate it as it helps me buy uh, better equipment for the channel. And it's, it, you know, it's just a nice way to show support if you do so desire. If you would rather, you can also check out the Redbubble uh, and Teespring for the channel, which allow you to support the channel and also get merch. I don't know how much anybody wants to rep Gutsick Gibbon as a channel or me as a person um, by, like, wearing my stuff or putting it on your stickers on your, like, laptop or water bottle or whatever. But if you do feel like it, there's also some cool, you know, merch that isn't necessarily tied to the channel. It's just like silly paleo memes, like a, a paleo shit post that you can wear on your body or put on your computer, which is cool. It's, it's a nice way to support the channel. So you can find all those links in the b below in the description. I almost said in the below. Um, that's the consequence of doing more live response style content. It's just that uh, you get to see my gaffes. <laughs> Which, whatever, you know, I, I hear authenticity is, is the lacking in the greater world today, so maybe that's a good thing. Um, anyways, yes, so I'm about to minimize. Minimize form. Look at that mini gibbon mode. Power. <laughs> Engaged. <laughs> um, Alright, cool. So in the background you can see our Standing for Truth channel catalog. Um, I do like his new logo, credit for that. I do like this new logo. Um, Tomorrow, if this video does come out as it should, you'll probably be getting my last video dedicated to this channel. This channel, I mean, the Standing for Truth channel, um, just because uh, for reasons that I'll kind of detail in there. But like I said, I, I do want to make sure I cover all my bases and make sure that 
uh, our boy standing, our, our, the brain trust really doesn't have the opportunity to say that, ah, well, she didn't cover this, ah, well, she didn't cover that. Because that's surely what he'll likely say instead of actually covering the content that I have presented to him. He's really been keen lately on saying that he's done a thing and then not having actually done the thing. Back in the day, we would call that being dishonest, but I far be it for me, maybe he's forgotten, maybe he's done something else. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you very briefly what I mean by that. Um, so we'll go to my, this is my video that's coming tomorrow. This is weird, it's right, it's like kind of going through time. Um, because this should, I'm recording this and it should be out in two days. You get what I'm saying, it's just silly nonsense that I'm talking about right now. Um, let's scroll down to our, our boy SFT. Ah, yes. Wow, only took a month and a half to respond. I hope this video has all Team Dodgeball in it and recycled arguments from peaceful science that I've addressed so thoroughly. I have a strong feel that we'll be getting the last word on this one. And then two smiling emojis. I like the emojis. I think the emojis are a nice touch. Um, now, you know, we get a couple of the, of the, <laughs> the vanguard of the truth coming in and telling Stink for Truth that he's kind of full of it, which he's right. But this is the one I, I want to which they're right, rather, but this I want to focus on here at Cheese Holt. I assume, I assure you that I've responded to every single one of Erica's arguments. Please feel free to see for yourself. I've compiled them all into a nice and organized playlist. Smiley face. Um, power move, putting the smiley face at the end of that. That's very bold. But unfortunately, that is certainly not the case, and I'll show you what I mean. So we'll go to his playlists, and we'll scroll down. Surely I've got my own, my own, Let's see, live debates with Gutsit Gibbon. Debunking Gutsit Gibbon. Okay. First of all, can we please appreciate that of all of the individual debunks, that's like, ah, debunking so-and-so, so-and-so, I have 33, so my numbers are, I'm doing very well. I, some have told me that it, this would be called living rent-free, and someone said, um, but I take it as a huge compliment because I really do see no other individual who has 33 videos dedicated just to them. Um, so let's click on it. Let's see our full playlist and, and dig into what we've touched on. Okay, so this is the video that we're going to be touching on tomorrow that you'll you'll be seeing tomorrow that I'm going through the very uh, tiny minutia of. Reviewing Gmit. This is a big one. I touched on this a little bit in my why. I, I think it was DNA similarity between humans and chimps because this is just full of bad arguments. Most of these, or at least a large portion of them, aren't actually dedicated to me, unfortunately. They don't actually have my name in them, which means standing is depriving me, ripping me off, so to speak, of my, uh, my algorithmic, my algorithmic benefit. But here's something that's really important that I want you guys to appreciate. A lot of this stuff I've responded directly to and have received no, um, substantial new argument, novel argument. A lot of that it has to do with the heat problem, a lot of that has to do with radiometric dating, which again we'll be covering in depth tomorrow. Today is more for paleontology and human evolution. But a lot of this stuff is just... I don't know why it's still in the list. It would be like the, the analogy, I'm trying to think of an analogy on the fly here, but it would be like if I... like in a presidential debate, that's very topical, let's say that. So in a presidential debate, if I'm debating an opponent in the presidential debate and I say that they have... Um, sold nuclear warheads to Somalia, right? And then the very next day, PolitiFact or whatever comes out and they're like, hey, by the way, what Erica said about her opponent in that debate was just flat out a lie. It just wasn't wrong, it wasn't correct, it was wrong. Um, and whether it was a mistake or a lie, it doesn't really matter. The fact of the matter is it, it doesn't hold water. And then someone created a, I created a playlist, right? That was like me debunking opponent, right? And I included that clip in there of me showing why the opponent is dumb because they sold nuclear warheads to Somalia. Well, that's already a trash argument in and of itself, but it's also been shown to be false. So why would I include it in my debunking list still? Why would it still stay there? The, the smart move would be to go and remove that. The honest move would be to go and remove that from the playlist. But as you will see, there's a lot of stuff here that I've already covered that still remains on the list. But that's okay. You know, we, we are patient with standing for truth. Um, I try to be patient with standing for truth. He, um, I think he's a, uh, I don't think he's a dummy. I think he's, like, not a dumb guy. I think he's very, Dan actually said something that resonated with me a lot the other day, uh, Dr. Dan Stern Carnell. He said on Peaceful Science Forum, which I will be shilling for tomorrow, 
that it really does feel like a like a he's speaking from a pulpit, right? It feels like standing for truth is is preaching at us. It doesn't matter how many times he's shown to be incorrect on something. He can pivot, he can obfuscate, he can do whatever he needs, essentially, to make sure that it doesn't come across like he's lost a point, right? He doesn't typically admit when he's incorrect on something, um, because to do so would make him look bad in front of his congregation. That's kind of apt, honestly. I hate to say it, I really do, but it is it is indeed very apt. Um, yeah, so this playlist dedicated to me, a lot of it is is just incorrect, and it's still being... Uh, like listed here. Um, I'm not 100% sure why. I mean, I am. I have a. I have an inkling. I have an inkling, but I am not 100% sure why. So, let's go to our videos and let's let's get started on what we're going to be doing today. Hmm. So, <laughs> we'll scroll down. Standing for Truth, to his credit, I guess because it's like a channel conglomerate. Like, there's a lot of people active and making sure the channel is running and producing content every single day like like a, a hideous genetically engineered chicken that produces too many eggs and thus uh, compromises the, the the quality of said egg we do get channel content every day from standing for truth and the gang um now this is the video the last video that uh he kind of directed at me that i addressed Orphan genes, this resulted in a, a sort of comment section discussion. This is something I'm covering tomorrow, which leaves our next video that we need to discuss mm. on channel. This one. Debunking Gutsik Gibbon on Australopithecus sediba. Now, you'll see that I haven't watched all of it here on the computer. That's because, like I said, I like to play a lot of this like while I'm walking and running. Um, this video right here and then i think there's another one that standing and raw matt did on uh freeman magnums or at least they're what yeah here it is freeman magnum is not evidence for ape to man evolution these two are both not worth going through one because i already commented on them and i'll show you what i mean uh but two because the arguments are just really bad like they're just not they're not worth it they're not worth your time they're not worth mine so i'm just going to show you uh the comment that i left as well as the sources that are here, um, because essentially what Raw Matt does in this video is he shows like constricted human skulls, pathologic human skulls, things like that, or the foramen magnum, that is to say, the hole at the base of the skull, you guys know, I do love the foramen magnum, I talk about it a lot, uh, the hole at the base of the skull, he shows some human skulls that are, again, pathologic or, or constricted by um, uh, external means like binding, skull binding and stuff like that, where the foramen magnum is further back and he uses that to justify the, the kind of assertion that foramen magnum position isn't actually a great way to tell whether an organism was bipedal or not. Um, and so I said, ah, guys, <laughs> eyeballing the foramen magnum is not how an organism is deemed bipedal. For this curious, here's a series of papers detailing the dozens of measurements that go into assessing the foramen magnum position and angle and other basic cranial features with regard to predictive power. Ah, yes, the gold standard of science. And essentially here are said papers. And what they do is they show us what we can use because it's not just the position of the foramen magnum, it's also the angle um, and it's other basic cranial features. Uh, features at the base of the cranium. And if we have postcrania, it's things like the bull shape of the pelvis, the vertebral column, how in line the big toe is, the midfoot, the angle of the femoral head, and of course the angle of the uh, of the knee, the valgus knee, some would say. All of these go into detailing whether or not an organism was bipedal. But then Ramat was kind of just like, yeah, whatever. He doesn't, really, he doesn't really comment all that much. He says, nope, of course not. In the debunking of R and Ra's systematic classification of life, I show why the orbital tilt is required in conjunction with the formation magnum to determine how something walked. It's clear the spi it's clear that the species many say walked upright did not, unless they liked looking at the clouds. Um, which is a weird thing to say because I've been very clear in many of in a lot of my material that it's not just the the position, it's also the, the uh, um, angle of the foramen magnum, but Ramat was kind of arguing against Aaron here, which is, that's fine, but in the video he doesn't actually detail that with the basic cranial features, the angle, and the position of the foramen magnum, uh, you can actually guess pretty well how an organism moved. Um, so that's why we're not going through this, because it's silly and uh, it's dumb, it's not worth our time. Plus he kind of roasts himself in the comments there. He's like, no, no, I know. I just don't like the ar the argument that Arn is using. Cool, we'll then specify that in the video. Um, 
This one we're also not going to go through, the, the fossil record low confidence evidence um, for human evolution uh, is Sediba transitional. And the reason we're not going through this is because Standing likes to do this thing where he reads a book and then he turns that book into channel content and uses all the buzzwords in the book. We saw it with replacing Darwin, where he used, you know, excessively words like created heterozygosity, which is, of course, not a real scientific term. He did it with contested bones, which was the he used the term paleo experts all over the place, and now he's using low and high confidence science, which is from a Stadler book. Now, Stadler is a creationist. He's a creation scientist. Oh, wow. Um, and he essentially made up a scale that was what is low and high confidence science, and then he lumped the uh, data that he doesn't like to deal with very much into the low confidence section. Turns out if you make your own scale, you can you kind of disparage anything, right? So it's that's not worth our time either. I genuinely think that Stadler book is just really stupid and dumb. Um, and I, I don't think it's worth addressing. If, if you think it's worth addressing, please let me know in the comments. I will go through it if you'd like. But from what I've read of it, I just kind of think it's, it's kind of not worth our time. Um, so that leads us to what we're going through first today. Debunking Gutsy Gibbon on Australopithecus Sediba. And unfortunately, uh, I don't have Adblock installed right now. So we're going to have to deal with a couple of ads. We're going to start back here. Um, and we're going we're gonna to enjoy ourselves. Hmm. I'm still not happy that I'm, you know, I'm absent from this intro. I've provided, as you could see from the playlist, a great deal of content for Standing for Truth. The least he could do was put me in his intro, but I took him over it. I'm totally, I'm totally over it. There's Stadler, by the way. That's the guy who wrote the book that Standing's been uh, harping on and on about lately. They're just getting started. Ah, look, that's me. Uh, it appears that really. It's okay. Now this is going to be a little bit awkward because um, he actually is doing something quite rare for his channel content, which is he's showing the video clips of the video that he's going through. And I'm in that video because it's a video of mine. So you're going to get like double Gibbon, double Erica for a minute. Um, and we're both going to have the displeasure of listening to uh, to my voice <laughs> recorded, which is not something I enjoy doing. But before we do this, I think I'm going to grab a little bit more coffee. I hope that's OK. With OK, I'm back. I got some coffee. I also got a banana because uh, I have not eaten yet today. It reminds me of a, of a very funny meme that I was just going to say to you guys what the meme was, but instead I'm gonna show it to you because I think it's funny. Let's see. This is the one. This is the one, I think. Whoa, my life is a teenage robot. It's a little bit, a little risque. This isn't the part, this isn't the funny part. Well, I don't know that you'll think it's Brother, funny. Brother, is it banana time yet? It will be banana time when it's banana time. A few moments later. Brother, is it banana time now? Banana time. It is indeed banana time. That is the time that we are at currently. You also have to eat bananas very carefully when, you, um, when you're on the internet. When we're talking about, like chomping at them, and that's because the internet is a terrible place. <laughs> One more thing I wanted to go through um, before we actually continue, and I thought of this while I was reviewing the previous segment, um, because I like to make sure that I don't make any major gaffes, because I do edit these uh, a little bit before I submit them to you. Something else that stuck out to me that I realized I didn't touch on was that Ramat also doesn't say, you'll notice that he says, ah, yes, many species that supposedly walked upright uh, probably didn't because otherwise they'd be looking at the clouds. He also just doesn't say the species. Which species, Ramat? Which ones don't walk upright? Which ones are incorrect? And it's very strategic that he doesn't mention them because he knows I'll just sink my teeth into, into those examples and show them, show him why um, you know, they're, they're really dumb. Because they are. They're, we know pretty well um, the species, the, the hominins that are at least facultative bipeds, why they are. So let's start. Let's start this. Nothing more than a conglomerate of the imagination. Um, Human missing link fossils may be jumble of species. Yes, this is from Barnes. I remember this one. 
I've seen this one from standing before Barnes. I can't I can't see it. No, I goofed big time on that. It's Ella Bin, and I also called her Ella Bean last time, which, you know, that's not how you say it. <laughs> well, maybe it is. I don't know. I, I think it could be either way, but I think Bin is probably a better way of going about it, and uh, standing definitely was correct on that, so credit to him. Um, so I talk about here, you know, why this is a you know silly thing to bring up given the context because we were discussing Habilis, Nephi was discussing Habilis, and then he mentioned Sidiba, uh, I'll show up the Sidiba versus Habilis. I'm not sure why he did that, uh, and I was kind of commenting on that. Also, um, let's all remember the time that Nephi said Australia Pythicus and Tibula because it's funny. <laughs> so let's let standing. Three hours of busting YouTube. Since retracted that. I don't know about Bean, but her co-author has since retracted that. Okay, so the screen's still shared. Want to make sure you can see this. Her video titled literally over three hours of busting YouTube creation. It's literally. that bad. And it was. Uh, look how mean she is. I've been losing sleep over this. So, I'm so but, you know, weird. we've been a little aggressive lately, so we're happy that she's also being aggressive. But at the end of the day, we like Erica. We're just debating the science, and we have no issues with her personally. So I do want to point out before I forget, too, I really like what – I don't want to touch too much on the whole high-confidence science versus low-confidence science. I just want to point out that the fossil record is as low-confidence science as you can get to, okay, for a number of reasons. According to Stabler – a creationist who also happened to make the scale. <laughs> Reasons that I explained earlier, but I want to—I need, I need to point this out that Dr. Rob Stadler points out in his book. It's a fascinating point, okay? So he says one of the world's foremost paleontologists, Jack Horner, presented a, br a brilliant TED talk in November 2011 entitled "Where Are the Baby Dinosaurs." <laughs> He presented numerous impressive dinosaur finds, each classified as a separate species and bearing the name selected by its discoverer. He then pondered why we never find baby versions of the name dinosaurs. By cutting into the skull bones and performing microscopic analysis of bone structure, he was able to estimate the maturity of each animal at death. As a result, many separate dinosaur species turned out to be different levels of maturity of the same dinosaur species. Ugh. Infants, adolescents, and adults of the same dinosaur species had been incorrectly classified as separate species. Let me read that again. Make sure everybody partying in the chat heard that. As a result, many separate dinosaur species turned out to be different levels of maturity of the same dinosaur species. This is just one of the many, many examples of the low quality and the low confidence nature of the fossil record. So... So, let's talk about this, because this is a big claim. First of all, I realized that I said we were doing times two speed, and then I forgot to do that. So we'll do that here going forward, if I remember, which I might not. <laughs> so appreciate here, first of all, the most glaring error is the false equivalency that we're using for comparing dinosaurs to hominins. Those don't always square, and if you're going to go ahead and use them and compare one to the other or use a, 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 a trait of one or a trend of one and apply it then to the other, you kind of got to preface why that's appropriate. At least I think that's good practice. I'm sure I don't always do that, but, you know, everybody makes mistakes. Everybody has those days, um, and everyone knows what I'm talking about. Everybody gets that way. Anyways, <laughs> that was a little throwback for those of you who are also mid mid 1990s um, youths. Anyways, yes, yeah, so essentially what Standing is saying here is that dinosaurs, we will find a new specimen of dinosaurs, give it a name, and then lo and behold, later on we find out that it isn't actually a new, unique species, it's actually just a product of the life history of a, of a, a separate species. So essentially, um, the, the, the classic example with this is uh, Nanotyrannus, which may or may not be a juvenile, regular Tyrannosaurus rex. Okay, it's not a new species, it's not a unique species, it's simply a younger version of an older, already named species. And what Standing is essentially saying is, ah, gah, he's implying, rather, that this could be the case with the hominins. And it's essentially, ah, what if, our, what if our transitionals are simply, you know, products of life history of something that is actually very ape-like? He said this before, and the reason why I hear creationists put this forward is because infant chimpanzees, infant chimpanzees, well, you see what I'm doing here. They look very human. Um, their their posture, their uh, the shape of their face, craniofacial features, 
they look much more human. Now, there is actually a hypothesis for why this is so, or rather why humans look like infant chimps rather than chimps look like humans, and it's the retained neoteny hypothesis, um, which is essentially the idea that humans retained neoteny, which is that humans, this is the picture that I was looking at here, right? This is a very these are very different. Forever child, neoteny, and neurodiversity. It's essentially that one of the uh, reasons why humans look the way we do, why our facial structure is generally at least resembling of a, a an infant, more, I guess, basal-looking ape, is because we retained neonatal features. And that allowed us to, you know, continue to grow our brain case size. Which, cool, um, that might be the case. I mean, this is pretty compelling right here. Chimpanzees and neoteny. So this is Pan. You'll notice how their skull actually changes through their life history versus a human, which doesn't change nearly as much. And then the similarities between the chimpanzee neonatal features and the human, and then the differences between the chimpanzee neonatal features and an adult human. So that's kind of the argument that he's making. What if the human transitionals are just young apes? That's stupid. Here's why. Humans and the rest of the apes, and coincidentally the rest of the mammals, are heterodontic. What that essentially means is we have different teeth that do different jobs, and additionally, humans, along with most other mammals, replace our teeth. In the case of humans and other primates, we replace them once. We have our deciduous baby teeth, and then we have our permanent adult teeth. So chimpanzee, permanent teeth timing. The reason this is important is because we can very adequately age fossil hominins. We can look at the skull and we can say to ourselves, this is either an adult that's finished growing or this is a child, a juvenile, a semi-adult, whatever. And the reason is because we have very good ideas on when the teeth erupt in primates, including humans. So this is one on macaques, but we also have one on chimpanzees and just primates in general. And we can time like when the teeth erupt. You'll notice human child skull. This is a bit morose, but when you look at the skull of a child, it is indeed pretty obvious that it's a child. Um, when you look, you pull back the uh, external bone of the jaws because they've still got all their baby teeth. You can also look at cusping, size, etc., and you can very adequately age a specimen. Why do you think it is, and this is directed directly at standing, why do you think it is that we know the difference between MH1, which is the juvenile specimen, and MH2, which is the adult? It's the size, it's the teeth, it's, it's the epiphyseal plates, too, um, in other cases. that You can tell the difference whether something is finished growing or not if the epiphyseal plates at the distal ends of the long bones are, are gone or closed. So keep this in mind moving forward, because standing is essentially like making a massive claim that anyone with this the slightest knowledge of paleontology uh, of, of mammals and humans in general, humans, uh, primates and hominins in general, would know is indeed uh, a, a bad criticism when they see it. They, they know that this criticism standing is making is uh, bad. It's not a good one. So let's let him continue. Infants, adolescents, and adults of the same dinosaur species had been incorrectly classified as separate species. Horner explained that this occurred because scientists have egos, and scientists like to name things in order to obtain fame in the discovery of a new species. Remember, they always ask, how do you get all these millions of species? Well, we've covered how it's very simple. It's not even millions of species. But one thing to point out is nobody remembers the guy who found the let's say fifth stegosaurus or tyrannosaurus rex fossil no they remember the guy who found the first so any little morphological difference anatomical difference they're gonna say it's a different species it's a new species give it a new name they got big e let me double check something really fast because i want to make sure about this before i make the point did dinosaurs did dinosaurs exist um what did Dinosaurs replace teeth throughout life. Let's see here. Like all toothy dinosaurs, prehistoric carnivores replace their teeth throughout their lives. Cool. So that's exactly what I'm saying. This is why it's difficult to definitively tell the age 
of, uh, of a dinosaur, or at least one of the reasons why I imagine it is very difficult to tell the, the age of a dinosaur, because they continuously replace their teeth. Um, humans don't. We primates don't. We get two pairs. That's it. <laughs> Which is bad if you're, <laughs> if you're an animal that evolved to eat, to crave sugar, sugary things, um, and the like in the modern age. Eagles, just like he said, you know, they want to get recognition. It's just so in, in so much interpretation, so much imagination, and the field itself is very competitive. So this is just the nature. It's it's it, it insanely biased when it comes to the fossil record. So I'll, let's see here. This is a simple example of how bias can be a very powerful force whose influence can overwhelm the limited power of the tool of science in a field such as this. When addressing a hotly contested issue like evolution, the power of bias will be further amplified. So it's just a fact. The bias... It's just a fact. I mean, there is bias in science. There's bias in everything. Bias is, is something kind of inherent to... Um, progress and success and ambition, because you obviously want your discovery to be new and novel. That's why peer review exists, because other people will shoot you down if, you're, if your discovery isn't new or isn't novel. Um, the, the number of times in anthropology where a, a paleoanthropologist has been like, hey, I might have found a new hominin, and someone else, a different paleoanthropologist, has been like, I think that's actually just an older hominin that we have that's maybe a regional variant, or perhaps just it was a bad assessment and you know something that ah this might be a brand new species is actually just another australopithecus afarensis or something along those lines this is why it's so important to have detailed uh holotypes detailed suites of characteristics that we can use to to differentiate one species from another um which is very difficult because species are indeed very arbitrary and the nature of evolution is that there is in fact a gradient also i forgot to double speed so let's do that let's do that really fast Playback speed times two, baby. Let's see if this works. This might actually be too fast. We'll see. So there, the assumptions is there. It's, it's too fast. It's too fast. We need. What do you think? Times one point five. Indirect. All six of okay. the criteria regarding whether something is high confidence science or low confidence science. The false record meets all of the criteria for low confidence science. So this is why we point out over and over again, it's genetics, it's biology. Genetics is what's inherited sperm and egg, and that's why we go into the non-recombining DNA, like the Y chromosome, the mitochondrial DNA that reflects two ancestors in the not-so-distant past. Leads to testable predictions, retro predictions. We've covered that a ton in the past. Oh, standing, you're in for a world of trouble tomorrow. Because no, the data does not support two ancestors in the recent past for all of humanity. But... I appreciate, too, that he's continually bringing up this high low confident science against the latest buzzword from the latest book that he's read. Um, and the scale is a Stadler original, so. But this is, this is the point. Um, Stadler continues, If bias could lead paleontologists to adopting the fallacy that a single fossilized species was actually several separate fossilized species, then a similar bias could lead paleontologists to adopt the fallacy that several distinct life forms with no evolutionary linkage represent an evolutionary sequence of life forms. So... Um, that's just one part there that I wanted to point out. Interesting stuff when it comes to this fossil record. But let's listen to our good friend Erica here. Okay, but that's me. Here. It's nothing more than a conglomerate of the imagination. Human missing link fossils may be jumbled of species. Yes, this is from Barnes. I remember this one. It was Ben. I've seen this one from standing before Barnes. I can't, I can't see it. There's a glare on my computer. Um, from 2000. Bone shreds. Bone shreds. Let's Bone see shreds. This. Okay, we can, we can probably go this one. We're getting a little tap heavy. Up top. Human. Missing link. Maybe just the. I do get tab heavy. Species. Okay, let's see. Colin Barrett. Okay, no, so wrong on that one. Okay. Image from Lee Berger. Okay, so this is, this is even on. Oh, we have a list. This is on Australopithecus sediba. Mm -hmm. I think there are two different hominin genera represented at Malapis. And Ellen Bean. That's it. It's Bean. Tel Aviv University. I remember this. I've discussed this with Stanley before. So Ellen, Ella Bean rather did uh, this analysis of Australopithecus sediba, which is the other one of the other sort of linchpin transitionals that link the Australopithecus genus with Homo. And uh, Bean essentially was like. I am kind of jealous. I will say of her fossils in the back there. Those are pretty cool. You should be jealous, Stanning. They are very cool. Maybe I'll have her send me one when we convert her to younger. No. Creation. No, no, no. I think it's a mixed comment. Bean's co-author has since retracted that. I don't know about Bean, but her co-author has since retracted that. We, we will look into this more at a later juncture. Love, love that. Okay, so let's let's cover this one. So let's pull up. So the, the paper here, the lumbar spine of the Australopithecus sediba indicates two hominid taxa. I want to point out that both Ella Bean and Yoel Rack are not 
young earth creationists. And even they've pointed out that Sadiba appears to be two different species, Homo and Ape. So let's discuss this as well. I'm going to be stopping standing. Um, the interesting thing about this paper, the lumbar spine of Australopithecus Sadiba indicates two hominid taxa, and I didn't know this in the past, but I'm glad I know it now. This is unpublished. This is an unpublished work. This was, if memory serves, at, yeah, a conference. This is a conference at Calgary. Not a published work in Nature or PNAS or Human Evolution or whatever. It's it's not published and thus, you know, is is sort of on a less high bar than, than other published works that have been subject to intense peer review. But keep in mind, too, uh, that, that standing is going to, or I guess you wouldn't keep this in mind, you don't know it yet, but allow me to preface. Standing is about to go on a very long spiel, and he's going to go through this paper. And that's good. That's very good practice. I don't get to see very often Standing for Truth going through papers piece by piece. So it's always good practice to go through the paper itself. And we're going to let him go through it, and we're going to kind of uh, critique as we move along. But something that's going to be a recurring theme in this video, because this is one of the ones that I have seen already, is he is going to say that it doesn't matter if Yola Rock retracted his his position that uh, Australopithecus sediba indicates two hominid taxa. He's going to say it doesn't matter over and over again. It's not true, he says, but it doesn't matter even if it is. So he's trying to cover all of his bases. He wants to have his cake and eat it too. So here's the reason why I stated that Yola Rock has in fact retracted. Let me find our... Can I... Yeah, this is pulled up twice. Nice. Nice, me. Good job. Let's see... Because I had a conversation with Standing about this already. Yeah, here it is. Okay, so Yola Rock is additionally an author on this paper. This is a more recent paper uh, from 2017. Australopithecus sediba and the emergence of Homo. Questionable evidence from the cranium of juvenile holotype MH1. So basically what this paper is saying is we're not sure that it's viable to say Australopithecus sediba is the root of genus Homo. That's fair. Um, that is 100% fair. I, I don't know that anyone besides Lee Berger was necessarily right after Sidiba, Australopithecus Sidiba was discovered, saying, ah, yes, this is this is the root of Homo. Um, they, I, most paleoanthropologists that I know um, consider that to be a jump of a gun, and I've actually asked a couple of them this very question uh, because of the YouTube channel. I've thought to myself, okay, well, you know, what do the people that I know think of Australopithecus Sidiba? Um, and a lot of them think that Berger did jump the gun on that one, which you know, cool. I've never said that Australopithecus sediba is the root of Homo myself. I've said it represents a transitional species, something that I've said to Standing for Truth many times, and indeed, most creationists I've talked to, I've had this conversation with them, not about sediba, but about transitional fossils in general, and what makes a transitional form. Every single time, what I've talked about is that it isn't the specific species that you can line up and create a March of Progress style uh, line of succession. That's not what a transitional form is. A transitional species represents an organism that occupies a position in a very large gradient of change in a suite of characteristics. So all of the basal traits of, of our common ancestor with chimpanzees, how they change into the suite of characteristics that are very derived that we have as modern humans. I've said this to standing, Obviously, it didn't sink in. You're going to see more and more that he doesn't seem to get that it's unimportant and it really doesn't matter whether or not Australopithecus sediba is, is a root line of Homo. In the same way that Australopithecus africanus and Australopithecus afarensis are both transitionals, even though it's very likely only one of them yielded the lineage that led to Homo sapiens, they're still transitional because they occupy a position on that gradient of change. Um, but, but something else here that's very important is that this article makes the very big assumption, even in the title, and by assumption, what I the word I actually mean to say is, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking at? Acceptance. They accept that Australopithecus sediba is, in fact, a valid species. Because what they're trying to do is assess whether or not sediba, Australopithecus sediba, is at the root of Homo. To do so would be to have to accept it as a species. And you'll rock is an author on this. So it appears that what has happened since this paper and this paper is a, a recantation of your rock's initial position that Sediba isn't a valid taxon. Now, of course, it suddenly seems that it is. In the contents of the paper, they confirm that. Anyone can, can go and check this out. I'll put a link in the description for, for, your, um, for your ease of, of use. But you know, and I said this to standing in the comments. That's the weird thing. I'm going to show you guys what I mean. We'll duplicate this 
and I cannot the 20, for the life of me remember which which 20 Hyundai Santa Fe featuring hold on I can't for the life of me remember which comment section it was I don't think it's this one I think it was an earlier one because what we did was we were discussing the nature of Australopithecus sediba and why this particular specimen um, is an example of your rock recanting his position. Okay, so here is the comment thread. Now, initially, Standing for Truth had essentially asked um, about one of the questions that I had posed to him in a previous video. Your question on Sadipa's upper arm and hand. What about the forearm? This is where the hand would attach. Please answer these questions so I don't misrepresent you. And I said, uh, hey, SFT, sorry I must have missed your comment. I'll go find it shortly. Ella Bin has not retracted her position. I don't believe I said she did, or if I did say that, it was unintentional, but her co-author has. Rock was an author on this paper discussing Australopithecus sediba and its relationship to Australopithecus africanus, which certainly considers the species legitimate. Bin, I am not sure on, but given you find her paper is, given uh, you find her paper is from 2014, so convincing, I've reached out to see if that is still her position. I'll let you know if I hear back. Then he says, does Rock specifically state in this paper that his, her position has been changed? Or is this just assumed since the paper has to do with Sediba? Thanks for getting back, by the way. Um, and then I said, the paper concerns the phylogenetic placement of Australopithecus sediba as a species by comparing its unique set of characteristics, and Rock is one of only two authors on the paper. I very much doubt any scientist would be one of two authors on a paper that concerns itself exclusively with the concept that they disagree with, the validity of Australopithecus sediba as a species being the case here. Uh, Rock here, um, if he has not changed his mind about the Malaba hominins, would be like finding Alan Fiducia, a notorious uh, secular scientist who doesn't think that birds evolved from dinosaurs, um, on a paper about how dinosaurs are related to birds. You might be able to reach out to him if you want to confirm. But when researchers change positions, at least as far as I know, they don't publish a retraction or even pull the original article. Uh, to be fair, uh, to be clear, rather, if he has explicitly detailed his thoughts on the original paper with Ben anywhere, it wouldn't be in a paper like this. It would likely be in a magazine or blog. Uh, and this is true, because in symposiums and things like that, um, symposiums, conferences, whatever, this is usually where things are hashed out among scientists, uh, rather than on, like, a website or in a journal. This is typically because, like, very exclusive fields tend to be small. People just, you know, they, they bring it up when they, uh, when they get around each other. And and uh, uh, Staying for Truth says, instead of uh, Rita Ellisie, he, he talks about how he, one of his one of his comments was deleted. Then he says, I wonder if we could find any blog or article that has the co-author admitting to a change of mind. Maybe there are some bones and therefore traits that he finds compelling as being some interesting Australopith, but still holds to uh, the bin conclusions. Tough to say, but I don't want to put words in his mouth. Okay, <laughs> so I said I'll ask uh, Ben if I get a response from her. That being said, it's really not common for researchers to point out to the public um, or point these these changes of mind out to the public, as in most fields, the only ones who really care are already at every symposium and meetup that the field has, as well as the pubs afterwards. Ha. Academia is kind of a small world within specialties, which is why if something is not evident, it's usually easiest to just reach out. Then he says, thanks for reaching out. Keep me posted. So I want you guys to keep that in mind because standing has you know, been informed this is from October 5th, and these were from three weeks ago, so much earlier. And what you're going to find is that Standing does not bring up the fact that Rock has been on a paper that, like, tacitly goes against his conclusions, or his stance, rather, in a previous paper. So, you know, it would be nice if he uh, brought that up, but he doesn't. I, I think that's a little disingenuous, but whatever, let's let him continue. And what's funny is, she wants to say that Yoel Rack has no. Actually, I was speaking to her in the comment section today to see any real confirmation if he's actually retracted his claims. There's no um, claim by him. He may have. I doubt it though. Um, but we have. We don't want to put words in his mouth. Why would you doubt it? He was on a paper that explicitly takes the opposite position, and the opposite position paper is more recent. It talks about how Ashokpathgas Sadiba is a legitimate taxon and how it's probably not what the, uh, the the root of genus homo, that it is an australopithecine, probably something off of australopithecus africanus. So w what's going on here, Standing? There seems to be a lot of posturing. There seems to be a lot of obfuscation, dancing, things of that nature. But this paper is actually rock solid. You'll have to request it to read it all. But um, Ella Ben, from my understanding, she has not retracted. And to be honest with you, I don't think Yoel did either. The paper is rock solid. Okay, it's not been published. 
it's not been published standing. And furthermore, why is that paper rock solid, but all of the dozens upon dozens of other papers that I've given to you, why are they not? Why do you not go over any of them on stream? Why do you not show them to your audience? I give them to you for an express purpose of, of letting you suss out my claims, so why don't you ever read them? Just a question. They can claim that, that he did, and maybe he did. I don't think it matters anyways, because the fact is, it's it's such an inclusive field, paleoanthropology. I don't think that he did, but even if he did, it's not a problem. That's that's what standing is, is basically saying here. It's the human chromosome 2 argument all over again. They, uh, ooh, I don't think that the human chromosome 2 fusion actually occurred, but uh, <clears throat> even if it did, it's not actually a problem. Okay? <laughs> but then why bring it up, then? <laughs> Why, why discuss it in the first place? It has nothing to do with the conversation at hand. Um, this, you know, I, I don't think you can get much more clear in the in the realm of science than someone being on a paper that is expressly presenting an opinion opposite to the one that you previously held. Please, let me know in the comments if you disagree with me. If you think I'm coming to the wrong conclusion here, then let me know. But I think that Rock being on a, on a paper on how Sediva is, is a valid taxon and, you know, where it belongs on the phylogenetic tree of hominins, I think that's pretty straightforward. It's so competitive. And not everybody's running around to try and disprove Sediba. So the fact that you have a couple paleo... Wrong. Absolutely 100% wrong. I talk to paleoanthropologists all the time because there's such a heavy overlap between paleoanthropology and primatology. And I can tell you for a fact the number of people out there who tried to roast Australopithecus sediba when it first came out is incredibly high. The same thing with Naledi. Anytime someone proposes a brand new hominin, people descend on it because guess what? You can publish if you can prove that it isn't. Anthropologists here pointing out the fact that, yeah, what you're looking at here is an artificial species. You've got two hominin taxa. I'm playing it off like it's one. All you need is one or two. So it doesn't matter if um, Yoel Rack from Tel Aviv University retracted his position here. And he's, but I doubt it because this is a pretty... Um, rock solid paper here it's again i'm gonna repeat this every time i'm gonna stop and repeat it every time so that you guys don't forget this isn't published this wasn't in any journal so i just wanted i'm looking here to see ella ben i want to i'm pretty sure she's the expert on this one anyway so she'd okay so evolutionary Evolutionary paleo experts Ella Ben and Yoel Rack, both from the Department of Anatomy and Anthropology at Tel Aviv University, presented their findings at the Paleo Anthropology Society in Calgary. What he's reading right there is from Contested Bones because it, you hear the word paleo experts. If you hear paleo experts, it's from Contested Bones. That doesn't appear anywhere else. Just FYI. Don't think that what he's reading from here is, is a legitimate source. Canada. A brief summary of their findings have also been published in New Scientist. Okay, yeah. So Ella Ben is an expert in spinal anatomy and pathology. Let me say that again. The paper, the lumbar spine of Australopithecus sediba, indicates two hominid taxa. Ella Ben is the one who definitely hasn't retracted. I haven't said, I searched like crazy to see if that was the case. Um, Ella Ben is the expert in spinal anatomy and pathology. Okay, so and there's been no retraction. So let's keep going. After examining photographs taken of the fossil remains assigned to MH1 and MH2, Ben noticed that the lumbar vertebra of the adolescent male, MH1, looks strikingly similar to those of Turcaniboy. Turcaniboy is a homo erectus specimen, hmm, interesting, eh? With lumbar vertebra, which are wider than they are tall, just as in modern man. On the other hand, the adults, females, MH2, lumbar vertebra resembled those of apes, being similar to australopithecines, which are taller than they are wide. Bin reports, according to our analysis, the spinal columns of the two skeletons represent two different hominid genera, australopithecus and homo. So you got an expert here in paleoanthropology, and then um, Erica, which she said in her video, that I just showed, she said, you know, these claims that they're artificial species, you know, these claims that you oftentimes get homo bones mixed in with the ape bones, Australopithecus bones, it's as if, a, it's kind of funny, <laughs> you think about it, it's like a human and an ape ran into each other and it just exploded, died together, their bones got mixed. Well, it, it's not that simple, even though it's funny. So credit where credit is due, but that's not the case. And we're going to get into that a little bit more later as to why. But here's the thing, experts here from paleoanthropology, they're admitting that this possibility is real. This is their conclusion. She's an expert on this. Um, so she continues. We comp now, I want to point out, too, they'll say that creationists. So in Erica's first video on it, and maybe she just forgot to mention it, her first video on Habilis and Sediba. I watched the video. I was aware of this. She had no mention of it. Made it look like I just made this up out of nowhere. And then I posted the article, not the paper, the article attached to this. And then she commented, and that's where she made the claim that one of them, as <laughs> if it matters, you know, supposedly retracted, but there's no evidence of that. Um, but here's the thing. There's no evidence of that. Remember, it's a completely, completely opposite position paper that's from 2017. Keep that in mind. Um, 
Also, we're gonna do a draw stream in a second. You're gonna be, this is gonna be something new. I hope you're excited. She should have um, brought this up in, in the, the, maybe she didn't know about it, I don't know, it doesn't matter, but. No, I knew about it. The reason I didn't bring it up is because it's an unpublished paper. The reason I didn't bring it up is because it is, Elabin stands alone as, an, as the only individual, to my knowledge, that accepts the results of her own work. Everyone else disagrees. So she's kind of violating the consensus. Now, what you could say is, well, you know, violate, there's nothing wrong with violating the consensus. And you'd be right. There isn't anything wrong with violating the consensus. What there is a problem with, though, is when you've got two conflicting data sets, right? Data, or rather, you've got two data sets with uh, conflicting results. And by results, I mean in interpretation of however the, the data itself was analyzed. And in this case, that would be the lumbar spine, lumbar vertebral column, rather, of two of MH1 and MH2. So here's something interesting. Um, this is a special issue right here. Uh, uh, just a whole host of insane authors on this, several different individuals. Um, and this was published in Paleoanthropology. Look at that, it was published. It was published in Paleoanthropology, a relevant journal, in 2018, four years after Ella Bin's work. And wouldn't you know it, it concerns the axial skeleton, the, vert the vertebra, ribs, and sternum, Washelopithecus sediba. So, what do you guys think we'll find in this paper, this more recent paper with more authors that was published and peer-reviewed? It's not going to be great for standing, I can tell you that right now. So, what we're going to do is we're going to control F, for Ben, we're gonna look at everything that we can see from Ella Ben. Additionally, now this is in the the introductory uh, introductory section. Additionally, we briefly address the hypothesis that the Malapa hominins represent two intermingled species rather than a single taxon. Ben and Rock, 2014. Rock and Ben, 2014. Ben and Rock proposed that the MH1 lumbar vertebra belong to Homo, whereas the MH2 lumbar vertebra belong to Australopithecus. In contrast, Rock and Ben proposed that the MH1 mandible is more similar to Australopithecus, whereas the MH2 resembles Homo in shape. Here we compare the MH1 and MH2 lumbar vertebra to one another and to other available hominin lumbar vertebra and test the hypothesis that they group within subadult homo and adult australopithecus respectively. We find no support for this hypothesis. So let's continue. Let's continue and see what work they do. Been distributed, cervical vertebra. This is the actual results. Here we go. Okay, the upper lumbar vertebra of MH1. So MH1 is the juvenile, I believe. See. Yeah, MH1 is the juvenile. Keep that in mind. That's important to remember because if you'll if you'll um, kind of recall from earlier in this video, we were discussing the nature of retained neoteny in human evolution, which is a, a retained trait. Okay, the superior vertebral body is complete. The inferior vertebral body is missing a small amount of the left lateral side dorsally. The right lumbar transverse process is broken, though not detached, and deflected supramedially, such that the lateral end of the process is oriented, or is oriented supralaterally rather than directly laterally, as it would be naturally. A crackle in the middle of the transverse process is visible dorsally and especially ventrally. The left lumbar transverse process is broken distally and preserved only at its base. So basically what they're doing is they're, they're describing the specimens of the lumbar vertebra of MH1 or juvenile. So due to the shape of the dorsal vertebra, blah, 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 with cervical and thoracic vertebra, the vertebral body is superior, inferiorly, or inferiorly short relative to the SI intraarticular facet height. The vertebral body is ventrally wedged, which is typical of upper lumbar vertebra. And Ben is actually a, an author on that, on that uh, paper that's cited there. Let's see, we wanna get to, blast rib has not been removed. Sorry guys, I'm trying to get us to, um, to our conclusion here. <laughs> The proposed association of the two specimens to have been an error appears to have been an error, as UW88165 appears to represent a right side rib. So they're talking about some previous errors that have been made in the assessment. Wouldn't you know it? Looks like people have been, um, you know, honest. That's insane. Here we go. This is what we want. Standing, this one's for you, buddy. A more recent paper with more authors that has been peer reviewed and published in a relevant journal versus an unpublished work with a single author that is um, essentially uh, educated to speak in the field of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's um, 
it's on the tip of my tongue. Shoot, what is it? Look at me, I'm forgetting all my words today. Hmm. It's gonna come to me like right when I start reading this, I'm gonna realize exactly what word I'm looking for. Who is, it's the word when somebody is, um, who has the authority, authorized to speak in the field. There it is. Okay. Differences between MH1 and MH2. Age or species intermingling. Though never fully published in a peer-reviewed journal, we briefly addressed Bin and Rock's 2014 critiques levied at the validity of the species Australopithecus sediba at the Paleoanthropological Society meetings, the abstract of which was published in this journal. Bin and Rock, 2014, identified the ratios that purportedly separate Homo erectus from Australopithecus and ally MH1 with the former and MH2 with the latter. Based on these results, Bin and Rock suggested that the MH1 vertebra belong to a member of the genus Homo and those of MH2 belong to an Australopithecus individual, thereby questioning the hypodyme of Australopithecus sediba. Here we test their hypothesis by examining the three indices in comparative age-structured context. So I want you to stop for a moment before we continue and really listen here, because I'm going I'm to repeat it just so that you guys can, um, can kind of put it to memory. They, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, suggested that, blah, 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 where is it? Okay, questioning the hypodyme of Australopithecus sediba. Not questioning whether or not all of the bones belonged to one species and all of the bones belonged to another species, but looking specifically at the lumbar vertebra, thus questioning the entire hypodyme of the species. What that means is that Bin and Rock aren't necessarily saying that Australopithecus sediba, the MH1 and MH2 hominins, don't in some part represent a new unique novel hominid species. Rather, that the lumbar vertebra specifically, and I believe they talk on the mandible as well, belong to two separate species. But again, even that is, um, is, is scant at best. Again, not published in a peer-reviewed journal, very old um, paper in comparison, or very old work in comparison to what we're looking at now, which is a series of papers published in paleoanthropology. But now we're going to go through their methods, because that's something that I think is very important. Hmm. And you'll forgive me, but um, it's very dry in my home right now, so I'm going to have to keep drinking water and tea and stuff to uh, ease my throat. Their first index, the ventrodorsal length of the vertebral bodies, that is relatively short when compared to the height of the vertebra, their craniocaudal length. So craniocaudal means uh, nose to tail, so in humans that would be the, um, the height, um, versus the ventral dorsal ventrodorsal length of the vertebral bodies. So ventrodorsal is uh, front to back, so like that. Okay, so in humans marked SI, craniocaudal, vertebral body growth occurs until the approximate, approximately 10 years of age, whereupon the incremental growth continues until the ring apophyses, apophyses, apophyses? Yeah, apophyses, fuse at 25 years of age. So that's, um, so earlier I mentioned uh, epiphys epiphyseal plates. Um, let me show you what those are. Epiphyseal plates. And these occur on the long bone. So I'm assuming apophyseal is specific to what we're looking at here. So epiphyseal plates are growth plates. That's all they are. Okay, bring us right back. Okay, hold on. Great, now I lost my place. Okay, we'll just start. Hold on. Ratio and then blah, blah, blah. Okay, at age of 25. When ratios of DV, dorsoventral uh, body length, to SI body height are taken, MH1 does group with Homo erectus and to the inclusion of MH2, which groups with the Australopiths. However, like MH1, both Homo erectus individuals are juveniles. And like MH2, all of the Australopiths are near adulthood. The presence of fused ring apophysis, apophyses of MH2 vertebra and absence on MH1 vertebra demonstrate that the SI vertebral body growth has ceased in MH2, but would have continued in MH1, with a better, less age-influenced variable representing the vertebral SI height is chosen for the denominator of the ratio. Um, MH1 lumbar vertebra fall within the Australopithecus afarensis distinction or distribution rather to the exclusion of D2672, whereas M to MH2 lumbar vertebra fall between two Australopithe uh, Australopithecus africanus species. So in their first, in the first categorization that Ben and Rock used, toss it out the window because the second that you consider how growth occurs in in living extant hominids and also extinct hominins, who of course we have quite a bit of vertebral material to test with, when you plot them all out and test it, in this 
specific range, the first range that Ben and Rock use, our MH1 and MH2 specimens fall into the Australopithecine, both of them, because MH2 was, was finished growing, whereas MH1 was not. This is an artifact of life history, not two mixed hominins. This was done statistically, but guess what? They also look at the other ways Ben and Rock categorized the two as a mixed species. So let's look at the next one. Ben and Rock's 2014 second index is the spinal, ca uh, spinal canal size relative to the dorsoventral Am I saying that right? Am I? It is dorsoventral, yes? Let me double check. I'm not going to lead you guys astray. I would never do that. Never. Dorsoventral. Please show me DV. I'm pretty sure it's dorsoventral. It would be dorsoventral. Or ventrodorsal. Depending on which way you're looking at it, right? Um, we calculate ratios of the measured area of the spinal canal over dorsoventral body length. All fossil hominins, including MH1 and MH2, fall well within the modern human distributions at each vertebral level, and no separation between Homo erectus and Australopiths or MH1 and MH2 is found. Their final observation, this has been in rocks, so that's our second one of Ben and Rock's observations, tossed out the window. Their final observation is that the articular processes are relatively large in MH2 and Australopiths compared to MH1, Homo erectus. We use a ratio of the calculated articular facet area over SI into articular facet height. While we find significant differences among the levels of lumbar vertebra, please hold. Ooh, we got some nice graphs there. We'll come look at those back in a second. We fail to identify any consistent pattern of separation between Australopiths and Homo erectus or between these fossil groups and modern humans. Results that may be due in part to methodology, i.e. measurement choice. Rather, we find that differences between MH1, upper middle lumbar levels, and MH2, lower lumbar levels, are consistent with change across vertebral levels. Overall, these results are consistent with other recent work that supports the conspecific partial skeletons as a single species, Australopithecus sediba, at the melopocyte, the two million year old melopocyte. Okay, so. Standing, when you respond to this, you must address this paper and the work that they've done here and explain to me why their work is superior to that of Ella Bins. I'm going to tell you why I think it's better. One, it's more recent, so it's working with, with better technology and perhaps better statistical analyses on hand, uh, depending on how much data you're working with. But number two, it deals with a larger sample size of, of hominins and modern humans. Um, we're essentially plotting out more hominins with more dimensions and finding out how we can group them. And you can look at these uh, these individual graphs here as well. And they, they pretty much show the same thing. They show you how our hominins how our hominins group. So bin and rocks vertebral body and and they use bin and rocks indices. Keep that in mind too. Um, other fossil hominins in modern humans note that the adults and juveniles separate in modern humans. Adults and juveniles are significantly different from one another. So essentially what they're saying is we see life history differences in the vertebral bodies of adults and, hum of adults, uh, and juveniles in humans and all the other great apes too. So a couple of things track here. The first is that we've got, you know, what I'm saying is why I, I think these results are superior to those of Ben and Rock's. Also the fact that Rock like backtracked on their conclusion but so better better analysis due in part to the actual sample size and the dimensions used and also their grouping so how they grouped together the hominins and the life histories of multiple hominins to come up with a overall more all-encompassing study analysis right it's they've done a better job here because they had more to work with this is in no by no means meant to say anything about Ben's work. Ben's work was good from what I saw. I mean, you know, I, I read I read the paper that she released and, you know, it seemed pretty compelling, but the problem is it's been superseded by more, like, comprehensive work. And so Ben also hasn't said anything, like, about this. She hasn't published any comments on this, on the work of Williams um, and company, which, you know, Typically, if you disagree with the findings of someone and you think that your conclusion should be upheld, you, you publish comments or you peer review. And I think that's all we've got, all I've got to say on this. Um, let me see here. Let me make sure that we've, yeah, and then here's, here's our references. 
But let's very quickly, now that we have concluded, or why, now that I've shown you why I find, um, why I find this paper, and this, this of course will, uh, this one we just went over. Oops, this is my, this is my thesis tab, or my thesis window. Now this is going to be in the description for you guys, but before we kind of close off on covering Special Issue of Australopithecus Sediba by Williams et al., I want to go ahead and, and bring up something else. I want to pretend for a moment that the work of Bin and Rock is correct. Let's say for a minute that it is. I don't think it is, and neither is that the consensus of not even both of the original authors. But what if it was? What would that mean for standing? And for that, we're going to do a fun draw stream. So one moment while I, while I swap over to that. Okay, so this should look familiar. This deal right here should... Um, you should recognize it. And the reason you should is because it came from my initial uh, creationists don't understand hominid fossils. This over here, um, let me let me see what I can do. Eh. Oh, wait, we want brushes. All of this, ooh, it's black. That's not what we want. Um, all of this, pew, all of that stuff, that's how Sanford and Roop, the authors of Creationist Book Contested Bones, that's how they assess the uh, MH1 and MH2 specimens of Australopithecus sediba. Now, Bin and Rock in 2014, 2014, boop, Bin and Rock, right? They assess the following. On MH1, boop, they think that the vertebra, specifically the lumbar vertebra, so it would be down here, I guess we should be specific about that. They assess the lumbar vertebra of both of these individuals. And just to double check, I'm going to read to you exactly what they say. Um, we briefly addressed the hypothesis that the Malapa hominins represented two intermingled species rather than a single taxon by Ben and Rock. They proposed MH1 lumbar vertebra belonged to Homo, whereas MH2 lumbar vertebra belonged to Australopithecus. So let's do that. Okay, so MH1 is going to be Homo, and MH2, Australo, Australio. <laughs> um, and then they also looked at the mandible, and they said MH1 mandible is more similar to Australopithecus, while MH2 resembles Homo in shape. So, that's kind of weird. Let's see. Mandibles, boom. Mandible, boom. Mandible, out of the mandible, we have Australo, and we have, oops, hair in the way, um, Homo. Yeah, we need to do that in color coordination, don't we? Oops. Let's see, there we go. Australo versus Homo. Cool. So, boom, boom, and boom, and boom. Okay. What does that mean? Well, if we'll remember from Sanford and Roop's <laughs> assessment, they think that the spine and jaw are a mix. And the reason that they think that is because they're actually taking that from Ben and Rock. So we can just can ignore that. We already know that. They think that the hip is human of both. So the hip remains are both human. Whereas they think that the rib cage is ape. Like that. Then they think that the upper limbs are ape did, did this all of that and then you guys get my sound effects hope you like them and then they think that the hands okay that's freaking classic isn't it wait are they not gonna let me do more than one undo thank god microsoft okay sorry upper limbs boop upper limbs boop boop and then they think hands are human of course they do. Uh, the crania and facial skeleton they think are ape in both, not over here, and not assessed at all would be um, the limbs and feet. So we'll do that in purple. Those belong to no one. So this is the assessment that we get from Elabin and Rock, and then also the creationists. So what are the problems? Well, thank you for asking. We are actually going to go ahead and consider that question in two parts. First, we're going to look at what the problems are with Rock and Ben with regard to how standing for truth is using their work. And then we're going to go through 
again, we're going to go through the work of uh, Sanford and Roop, the work of Sanford and Roop, and discuss why it's, um, why it's hot garbo. Now, for Ella Bin and Rock, consider the fact that the only bits of Australopithecus sediba, MH1 and MH2, that they are really considering uh, are the mandibles and the lumbar vertebra. We kick those out, what do we have? Two mosaic hominins. Still, we still have two mosaic hominins. And the reason why I say that, and you know, two mosaic hominins of, of like two individual mosaic hominins of the same species, the reason I say that is twofold. Because, boom, we have this, the skull of and, and uh, uh, cranial, crania and craniofacial skeleton of MH1, as well as the arm of MH2, all the way tracking down into the wrist and the hand, um, the legs of both, we have the pelvis, and we have the rib cage. Now you might be thinking, okay, why is that important? And the reason that it's important is because if you'll notice, let me allow me to back this up a bit, and let's use a new color, let's use yellow. The pelvis, we have pieces of the pelvis that match. You can cross-check those, and you can know that they're from the same species. We have arms that match. That is to say, humerus and, um, and the lower arm bones, the radius and the ulna, bits of the radius and the ulna. Wouldn't you know it? They match. So we know we already have two individuals, right? Because a single individual isn't going to have two right arms. So this is obviously two already. We know that the hands match. We know that these, and what I'm saying when I say they match, I mean they share the same characteristics, which means that these are from the same species. This would be, um, for example, uh, let's say I have a big pit. Here's my pit. Look, there, there's the lines of the pit. Here's some grass at the top of the pit. Um, and at the bottom of the pit, I have a bunch of, uh, let's say, what do we want to say here? Let's say monkey bones. Hmm. A ton of different monkey bones. Okay, here's the bottom of the pit. Um, and here's a skull of a monkey. And here's some bones. Ah, it's so creepy and gross. Just kidding, I think it's awesome. Um, anyways, yes, so here are your monkey bones. Now, if we were to go to this pit and reach our lovely hand in there and say, ah, I have found two hands, two right hands, and they match perfectly in, um, in morphology, then I could safely assume that in this pit, even if there were multiple different monkey species present, that at least those two hands belong to, say, a baboon. Here's our baboon. Baboons are mean, and I don't like them very much. They're like one of my least favorite um, primate. Here he is. He's sitting. Um, and then let's say I find another two pieces of pelvis, and they both match chakma baboons, let's say. Well, look, now we still know that we've got two individuals of, of the chakma baboons. And then let's say I find, oh, I don't know, let's say I find the mandible of a colobus monkey. And colobus monkeys are cute. So we'll draw a little colobus monkey here. They have those, sometimes they have those long capes. And they sit on the tops of the trees, and sometimes chimpanzees hunt them, and it's, you know, it's a bummer, but it's also, you know, good for them. They're getting it. And then let's say we find a mandible from, from a colobus monkey, and then a couple of teeth that are also from a colobus monkey. The fact that we find those in the same location doesn't change the fact that we have very, very, very solid morphologic evidence that we have two baboons present and two colobus monkeys present. Does that make sense? So even if we're dealing with um, Elabin and Dual Rock's work being True, which again, unpublished, unaccepted by the majority of the uh, paleo paleoanthropology community, um, that doesn't change the fact that we still have two unique hominin species that occupy a mosaic position, even if the lumbar vertebra and the mandible aren't present. In fact, arguably the most mosaic features are present in the skull and the arm, the upper limbs, and maybe the feet, depending. Okay, good. So now we understand each other. Oh God, oh God. This is bad. I've messed it up. We've gone too far. Might have to like repaste in. Might have to repaste in this picture again because this next bit is also important. So now that I'm gonna do that now, but while I talk. So considering what I've just said, we know that regardless of whether Standing for Truth wants to put his work behind or his uh, hitch his proverbial wagon to the work of Ella Bin and you all rock but really currently just Elabin. Well, that's fine. It doesn't change the conclusion that so many other paleoanthropologists have reached. 
that these are indeed legitimate species um, to legitimate taxa. There we go. Two legitimate individuals, my mistake, uh, from the unique taxa. Boop, there we go. Now, they're, they're bigger, but, you know, we're just going to have to deal with that. And um, I guess we should probably go ahead and mark... Eh, eh, we'll keep it in mind, because we've got our little our cheat sheet right beside us. Hmm. So like I said, we're going to go ahead and just give it to Sanford and Roop that the spine and jaw are a mix. Again, I don't think they are. No one, no one really does. But let's just say that they are. And let's, let's run with that. So we're remembering, golly, I just sometimes. So we're remembering that the hip is homo, red for homo, um, according to Sanford and Roop. The hands are homo, according to Roop and Sanford. Again, neither of which are paleoanthropologists. And the, or sorry, blue, the crania, but I guess it's just the crania, not the mandible. The crania are considered to be, by them, to be a uh, ape, <laughs> and the ribs are considered to be ape, as well as the arms being considered to be ape. Boop, and boop, great. And then, this is the oh so very important part, the lower limbs are not assessed. So you're probably wondering, okay, why? I'm about to tell you, it's embarrassing. So, with this in mind, let me go ahead and switch us over in OBS because we are going to do some investigating. And first, the very first investigation that we are going to begin with is going to be that of the pelvis. And so, they say that the pelvis is indeed human. Let's go from there. Okay, so, sorry, I'm moving. You're getting new camera angles. That's the, uh, that's the winning ticket of this entire video is uh, new camera angles. You're welcome. Every angle is my best angle. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, so first of all, we're talking about this partial pelvis. Now, as you know, as you should know by now, if you do, in fact, frequent this channel, uh, if you do, thank you, you know, I really like looking at the papers. I'm really, I'm really, I just, that's gonna be rough on the ears. I just hit the mic. This is why I don't do this this way. I was trying to pop my collar. This is why we go straight to the papers. We like to see the uh, the initial paper itself and read it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Hey, Stanning, don't you like to use that phrase now? I wonder if I would find it in Stadler's book. Um, a partial pelvis of Australopithecus sediba. Now this is from 2011, so this is a pretty old paper, but I haven't found a ton on the pelvis since then, and generally speaking, no one is having any revolutionary opinions about the nature of the pelvis. So what is the nature of the pelvis of Australopithecus sediba? Let's read the abstract and go from there. The fossil record of the hominid felt pelvis reflects important evolutionary changes in locomotion and in part uh, parturition. parturition. Um, the partial pelvis parturition would be uh, birth, by the way, giving birth. The partial pelvis of two individuals of Australopithecus sediba were reconstructed from previously reported finds and new material. These remains share some features with Australopiths, as well, uh, such as rather uh, large biacetabular, biacetabular, my mistake, the acetabulum is the, um, uh, by the femoral, where the femoral head pops in, the, the little socket. I'll show you what I mean, so you... It's a tabulum of the pelvis. Yeah. Socket of the hip bone. Ta-da! So, what is it saying here? Uh, okay. These remains share some features with Australopiths, such as a large biacetabular diameter. So, whoop, biacetabular would be along the width of the acetabulum. Uh, as well as small sacral and coxal joints, and a long pubic rabbi. The specimens also should derive features with homo, including more vert or vertically oriented and sigmoid shaped iliac blades, greater robusticity of the iliac body, sinusoidal interior iliac borders, shortened ischia, and more superiorly oriented pubic rami. These derived features appear in a species with a small adult brain size, suggesting that the birthing of larger brained babies was not driving the evolution of the pelvis at this time. Now, another favorite little tidbit of mine that I like to share is that one of the most famous arguments in paleoanthropology is which came first in human evolution, big brains or bipedality. And what is it I always say? 
because I know I have a lovely chat. Why don't you guys tell me? What do you think that, the, that came first, bipedality or big brains? Press one for bipedality. Press two for big brains. <laughs> Where's my kazoo? That's what I really need. Oh, you know what? My kazoo's at. I know it's back here. Hold on. Let me find it for you. <laughs> Time's up. If you said uh, it was bipedality, you're right. Bipedality did come first. Um, so if bipedality comes first, wouldn't you suspect that the pelvis would change before the brain case? Yes, you would. <laughs> you would absolutely expect that. But the fact that Sanford and Roop are, let us go back to our quick list here, change it around in uh, yep. The fact that Sanford and Roop are saying that the <laughs> hip is human um, is asinine and bad. Of course, what will we expect from Roop? A glorified layman. Now, let's see what else this paper has to say. We'll go ahead and scroll through because I know we're going to get some very, here's an awesome diagram here. Coxal remains of MH2 in internal and external perspectives. This is a great image, kind of shows you the resemblance that we see um, in the blades to a classic human bowl-shaped pelvis. Continue on downward. Oh, look, morphologic features of Australopithecus sinipa pelvis. The adjective relative and the adverb relatively should be taken to mean relative to body size. Adjectives such as reduced, increased, expanded, etc. are related to conditions normally found in the two best known species of Australopithecus uh, afarensis and africanus. Wow, it looks like that's a really nice chart that details all the specific morphologic minutiae that standing never goes over. Cool. What else do we have? Oh, well, would you look at this? The uh, obstetric, yeah, obstetric, obstetric dimensions and indices of female fossil and extant human, or extant rather, hominid pelvises. All measurements are defined. Cool. Look at that. What else do we have here? We've got Homo sapiens, we've got Pantroglodytes, we've got MH2. We have AL2881, I believe. Oh, God. This is coming back to bite me. AL2881. It's Lucy. See, I should know that. That's the most famous one. You'll have to forgive me. It's pretty late. I've been doing this on and off all day. Um, for record. Okay, so STS14. Coming in. STS14 is Africanus. So we've got Afarensis. We've got Africanus. And BSN49. 49. Hominin. And we have a different sediba. No, erectus, my mistake, erectus. Cool, so we've got a great sample size, some awesome stuff to compare to, and it looks like we're finding a mosaic pelvis. So here's the question, although mosaic trending homo, which would be expected because bipedality came first, so we should have small-brained apes walking on two legs before we have big-brained apes walking on two legs. So it would seem that right off the bat, our boys, Sanford and Roop, and by uh, proxy, standing for truth, are being dummies. <laughs> so let's go ahead and check that off the list, shall we? Go ahead and get over to our paint section so we can do a big orange eh, wrong. Doesn't work. Looks to Now, we could shut this case right here, right? We could say it looks like we've got a ton of mosaic different features just in the pelvis. It certainly does make for a nice ape man. But, mmm... Let's give standing some more homework, shall we? Allow me to give you a lesson in literature searching. And by lesson, I mean, allow me to remind you of the common sense that you should use when engaging in a literature search. Now, let's hop over. Boop. So, this is the paper we're gonna be looking at for the rib cage, and you might notice something kind of funny. You might be saying, this is an old paper. It's from April. 2013? And the answer is yes, it is from April 2013. Oops, what I what have I done here? What have I done? What have I done? Hold on. Get that boy back up there. Nice. Anyways, why are we using an old paper? Especially if, wait a second, this paper, which is the, hold on, please show me the name. Oh, I really don't want to have to come back down here. This is a more updated paper, essentially. It's from Paleoanthropology from 2018, and it is the sternum, ribs, and um, vertebra 
of our uh, Australopithecus specimens, MH1 and MH2. And the reason is because while this paper does an excellent job of describing new material, it does actually reference older work, one of which is the one we're looking at from 2013. Wow. Wouldn't you know it? Make sure. Yeah, Peter Schmidt. Yeah. And that's why I actually went to this last paper, because while this gives an excellent description of the new finds, it doesn't really define our, our holotype specimens, which is what we're looking for, because very specifically contested bones deals with MH1 and MH2. This does bring up another important point, though. Contested bones, and by, you know, by proxy standing for truth, very frequently will only deal with specific specimens rather than also considering the big picture, the specimens outside of MH1 and MH2. As this paper here notes, because of the new material, we actually have up to six hominins at the site. A totality of skeletal elements include an MNI of six hominins from Val et al. 2015. Given similarities in size, epiphyseal fusion, and dissociation of the postcranial axial material, it is probable that it belongs to two known partial skeletons, including juvenile male MH1 and adult female MH2. So, boom. Very nice. Back to our 2013. So, what do we know? Well, There we go. Well, for one, we know that our boys think that oh, the rib cage is ape. How tragic. Is it ape? Well, considering this paper is titled Mosaic Morphology in the Thorax of Australopithecus sediba, I think you know the answer is yes, but not in the way that they think, because humans are apes. That's the point. Yes, of course it's ape, but it's not ape to the exclusion of humans. Hmm. The shape of the thorax of early hominins has been a point of contention for more than 30 years. Owing to the generally fragmentary nature of fossil hominin ribs, few specimens have been recovered that have ribs, rib remains complete enough to allow for an accurate assembly of the thoracic shape, thus leaving open the question of whether the cylindrical-shaped chest of humans and their immediate ancestors evolved. Or rather, when the cylindrical shape, yeah, when it evolved. The ribs of Australopithecus sediba exhibit moderately narrow, ape-like upper thora thoracic shape, which is not unlike the broad upper thorax of Homo that has been related to the locomotor pattern of endurance walking and running. The lower thorax, however, appears less laterally flared than that of apes and more closely resembles the morphology found in humans. Funny that. It looks like Sanford and Roop and thus standing kind of forgot about this. And also, if you actually get in depth into some of the stuff that Standing and you know uh, Sanford and Rupp have said, sometimes you can get you can dig into it and find creationists uh, that, and I can't remember if they actually say this in Contested Bones or not, but who will say, ah, well, the upper, like upper rib cage, that's ape, and the lower rib cage is human, getting ahead of the game. Except, oh no, remember when it said that the upper portion of Australopithecus sediba exhibits an ape-like upper thoracic shape which is unlike the broad thorax of Homo that has been related to endurance walking and running. Remember when it said that, and then it talked about the lower thorax, and then in the whole rest of the paper, it proceeds to talk about the moderate articulation that we see in these ribs with the uh, vertebral column, meaning that they, uh, they're connected to the vertebra, which also shows an association with the uh, pieces of the pelvis, which is markedly human. Oops. Looks like someone forgot to check in on that paper that I showed last time and also the time before that, which discussed the articulation seen in MH1 and MH2. Wow. Boy, it sure would have been great if you'd been able to look into this one and kind of jump the gun on the um, patent dumbassery being put out by Sanford and Roop. So, lumbar vertebra, we've got a lot of of uh, articulation going on there. The sacrum, in case you don't know what the sacrum is. It's the end of the pelvis, or end of the uh, vertebral column. That's kind of important. So please consider here, that what we're dealing with is series. What we're dealing with is a series of articulations that, like in tandem, create big problems for Sanford and Rope. But let's, um, yeah, let's let's get into that a little bit. 
I wonder if they cover it at all here. R T U. Oh. Hmm. 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 Both individuals preserve a number of thoracic remains that were found in near articulation and that elucidate the form of the thorax in Australopithecus sediba. Uh-oh, standing. The ape-like conical thoracic shape also appears apparent when the trunk skeleton is re-articulated. To create a three-dimensional reconstruction, we, re we articulated the ribs of MH2 and R6 of MH1 using MH2's thoracic vertebra and the interpolating morphology of the T1 and T2, blah, 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 blah. The shape of the thoracic inlet was obtained by uh, articulating the right rib in the first manubrium, or rather the manubrium, there's only one, allowing for the appropriate gap for the costal cartilage. Basically what they did was they used that really nice ape-like thorax, and that actually informed the uh, very human-like lower thorax. So that's kind of problematic there standing. What do we got next? Hello? Is computer dying? Computer, please. Don't do this to me. We already covered that one. Hmm. The shape of the thoracic inlet was obtained by articulating the first rib in the manubrium again. Hmm. In both apes and humans, there is correspondence between the shapes of the inferior rib cage and the false pelvis. Thus, the derived human-like vertebral reorientation and greater curvature of the iliac blades lead us to suggest that its lower thoracic shape could be could not could not be like that of an ape. Wow. This inference is supported by a fragment of the ninth rib found in association with the MH2 skeleton. This rib is slenderer. I would imagine you would say more slender than the more cranial flat fragments, a condition very different from the other inferior ribs. In addition, it appears to show distinct torsion along its body, which is characteristic of the reduced last rib of humans, but not apes. What are you going to do about this, standing? When are you going to read the papers, bud? Come on, you're killing me with this. Sit through all your videos. I watch them all. Hmm. Listen to them all, I should say. And um, and you don't get back to me. Also, why is this paper not cited in Sanford and Rube's book? And when I say this paper, I mean all of these papers that I'm going through. Why aren't they listed? Why aren't Sanford and Rube covering them? Ah, it's because they're problematic. Wow. Wowee. So, I think we can close the case on our... Let's see here. Boom. I think we can close the case on our rib cage. And the reason we can close the case on it is due to... Uh, articulated art articulatability, the articulation ability of the rib cage, as well as the corroboration of MH1 with MH2 to confirm that there are indeed two individuals present. So let's go to our orange, knock that one out. Oh, this one's fun. The limbs, hmm, our upper limbs. What is it that they say that they are? Ape? Hmm but the hands are human. So we're gonna knock both of these out at the same time. I think that would be a good idea. What do you think? Heh, you don't have a choice, you're the audience. Tremble before my will. <laughs> I'm just kidding, please don't leave. I get so lonely without you here. Okay, boom. Cool, so now let us move about. We've got the thorax settled. We have got the vertebral column settled. This is the skull, we'll be coming back to that. This was how I found that skull paper. It was surprisingly difficult to find. That's why I'm gonna link it for you guys so that you don't have to do the search. Wink, it's cause I love you so much. This is the full special issue. Maybe this one. Now we'll be coming back to that one too. Mandibular ramus shape, we'll be coming back to this one too. Dental morphology. This is the hand, we'll be coming back to that. We actually don't, I don't think we actually need the nature one cause we have our, uh, who broke in here and put Sci-Hub on my computer? It definitely wasn't me. Briefly before we go through these papers, I want to talk about something that is equally if not more important than the material itself, which is a paper we've gone through before already, you're going to be shocked to see it again, which is a paper that covers the articulation and association of the remains of Australopithecus sediba, MH1 and MH2 in particular. Very particularly, specifically, I guess I would say, we're going to talk about the relationship of the arm to the hand on MH2, this right arm and right hand. So let's activate window mode. Ta-da! You remember this. We've seen this. <laughs> this is an important paper. Hold on just a sec. Hello? Paper. 
paper. Yeah, here it is. So this is our paper that's very important. If you'll remember, we discussed articulation and association already in previous videos and why they're important because it talks about the nature of the hand, the nature of the upper arm, specifically the uh, radius and the ulna with the humerus, as well as the scapula with the humerus, um, the manubria with the clavicle, manubrium with the clavicle, the complete right hand. And you'll notice that the right hand is, has an unstable articulation, or has an unstable articulation, but the state is near complete. So, you know, again, we have all of these types and all of these states. And because of the types and states, it allows us to recreate the burial position. I don't know why I'm looking down at my tablet instead of up on my computer. It allows us to um, recreate the burial position, which is, of course, very important because what is the burial position of the arm and hand? Relatively contiguous. What does that mean? Again, I, I don't know how many times I, I have to bring this up. You've got two hominins, like two near complete hominins represented at the site, and then a bunch of fragmentary remains of other hominins. Both of them share the same, like relatively the same suites of characteristics. And both of them are found in large blocks by themselves, essentially. With, and then the, the pieces that aren't by themselves are, are what is very clearly debris that can be matched up with the correct faces, um, as seen here. Hold on, as seen here. Hold on, as seen here. Right? So, for instance, the skull of believe this is MH1. Yeah, MH1 is found away, it's like slightly away from the rest of the skeleton, as I'll show you below, but it can be assigned to that species because the the uh, debris, the actual dirt sediment found within the skull cavity itself matches that with the rest of the hominin. Isn't that neat? It's very cool what we can do with science and geochemistry. But yes, so that's that's something that's very important because that allows us, that in and of itself allows us to know at the very least, at the very least, that this hand, wait, you actually can't see it, I'm still, hold on, hold on, hold your horses. I keep forgetting I have to go to OBS to like click all this on and off. No, that stays on, that goes, okay, perfect. This allows us to know at the very least that this hand and this arm, along with the scapula and most of the vertebral column, um, belong to a single individual, right? But if that weren't enough, as if that weren't enough, let's look at the nature of the arm and hand in general of these Malapa hominins, of these near complete specimens of Australopithecus sediba. So very quickly, we will look at the upper arm and the upper arm i think the upper arm is pretty solidly basal but we'll read the abstract anyways the evolution of the human upper limb involved a change in function and form from its i, I added the inform by accident because i saw the from so let's start again the evolution of the human upper limb involved a change in function from its use for both locomotion and prehension as an apes to a predominantly prehensile manipulative role hanging from trees to using tools um well preserved forelimb remains of a two million year old Australopithecus sediba from Alaba, South Africa, contribute to our understanding of this evolutionary transition. Whereas other aspects of their postcranial anatomy evince mosaic combinations of primitive and derived features, the upper limbs, excluding the hand and wrist of the Malapa hominins, are predominantly primitive and suggest the retention of substantial climbing and suspensory ability. The use of the forelimb primarily for prehension and manipulation appears to arise later, likely with the emergence of Homo erectus. So on the face of it, this seems to match up with what Sanford and Roop say, right? <laughs> Wrong. It's from the SpongeBob episode. Um, first of all, predominantly primitive. That's not entirely. That's kind of important. But secondly, the hand isn't entirely derived. So we have a mostly basal upper limb. This kind of goes through some of that with Australopithecus sediba. It discusses that the majority of the aspects are relatively primitive, at least compared to the hominin lineage. But if you want, you can take a look at some of these and you'll, these graphs here, most of these graphs down here, will plot MH2 with our main great apes and somewhat away from Homo, but closer to Homo than the large majority of the other data points, which is important. This is just for the upper, M, upper limb. So 
Scapula, Humerus, um, Radius, and Ulna. So again here, we have a relatively close plotting to Homo, but certainly not plotting with Homo instead of the other apes. So again, at first glance, you might think, oh yes, well, this is indeed very compelling. Hmm, not so. This is a paper from 2020. Look at that. The most, only the most recent papers for my viewers. The position of Australopithecus sediba within hominin hand use diversity. The human lineage is marked by transition and hand use from locomotion towards increasingly dexterous manipulation. Uh, concomitant, concomitant. I've never heard that word before. Concomitant. So in association with, I think is what that means. Concomitant. Naturally accompanying. Okay, cool. Well, you learn something new every day. You guys can treat this as your word a day calendar. We'll learn together. Could accommodate with bipedalism. The forceful precision grips used by modern humans probably evolved in the context of tool manufacture and use, but when and how many times hominin hands became principally manipulative remains unresolved. We analyzed metacarpal, trabecular, and cortical bone, which provided or which provide insight into behavior during an individual's life to, to demonstrate previously unrecognized diversity in hominin hand use. The metacarpals and palm of Australopithecus sediba, metacarpals of the palm in Australopithecus sediba, have trabecular morphology, most like orangutans, and consistent with locomotor power grasping with the fingers, while that of the thumb is consistent with human-like manipulation. This internal morphology is the first record of behavior consistent with a hominin that used its hand for both arboreal locomotion and human-like manipulation. This hand use is distinct from other fossil hominins in this study, including Australopithecus afarensis and Australopithecus africanus. So all of a sudden, this proposed contrast that Rupin and Sanford present between the upper limb and the hand becomes much more of a gradient, doesn't it? Now, let's, let's continue onward. For the record, it does make sense. It might be weird to some of you out there thinking, okay, well, why is it plotting with more with orangutans than the other African apes? Doesn't that seem problematic? Well, no, because our ancestors, if the climate is anything to go off of, would have not been capable of doing long-term knuckle walking, right, across the savanna, and would have been much better off seeing above the, the grasses when they're on the ground, and then clambering through the trees, you know, whilst trying to, to nest and, and do those kinds of things, which lends itself to a more suspensory style thing. You know, you've got spread out acacia trees and the like. It, it's just not going to help you very much to be, you know, adept at like, quadru like quadrupedal or, or arboreal quadru quadrupedalism. My mistake. Again, it's very late for me. Let's see here. This is a very cool. This is very cool. Hand postures are shown for knuckle walking in gorilla, arboreal locomotion in pongo, and manipulation in humans. Although not habitually used by pongo during arboreal locomotion, the arrow in B illustrates adduction of the thumb using pad to the side grip, habitually used by all non-human apes. The arrow in C shows the abduction of the pad to pad, opposed to thumb in humans during pushes and grips. I mean, that's really sick. Okay. And this is how we see Sediba plotting. So essentially just informs what, what we just said. More stuff here, relative cortical bending, stiffness of the thumb at the mid shift. I mean, like, again, like a lot of creatures kind of pretend that, that this is like eyeballing, but there is so much that goes into a statistical analysis just looking at the hand. This is a 2020 paper. So a 2020 paper, the most up-to-date literature on the hand of Australopithecus sediba, has found that the hand is indeed a mosaic, just like almost other, every, almost every other aspect of it. Let's see what else do we have. I think I've got some more hand stuff here. Huh, gross. Yeah, yes. Even back in 2011, they were saying that it's mosaic, though. 
So, I know, you know, why Roop and them think that it's a, a human hand? If memory serves, I think it was literally because it looked human. So we're talking Laetoli Footprints logic here, their Laetoli Footprints logic. Yeah, so this older one also discusses basically the same thing. The hands presents a suite of Australopithecus features, such as a strong flexor apparatus associated with our royal locomotion, and homo-like features such as a long thumb and short fingers associated with precision gripping and possibly stone tool production. Comparisons to other fossil hominins suggest that there were at least two distinct hand morphotypes around the Pleiopleistocene transition. The MH2 fossil suggests that Australopithecus sediva may represent a basal condition associated with early stone tool use and production. So I think we can safely go back to our... Hold on. Oh, this is such a pain in the ass. Okay, boom. I think we can safely go back to our paint. And we can say, no, <laughs> actually, the upper limbs are not just ape, they're predominantly basal, but they're not just ape, and the hands aren't human. In fact, let's use dark red for this. Most of this dark red we're going to say means mosaic. Most of it's mosaic. Wow. Interesting. Fascinating. I wanted to let you guys know too, I actually forgot to talk about this one a minute ago, but it's yeah, still important, so we do have to discuss it. Um, the mandibular ramus shape of Australopithecus sediba suggests single variable species. Sick. We love that. A single variable species. Now, I know people like don't like the idea that Erectus, Homo erectus, and Homo ergaster were super variable, but they were. So what this paper essentially did, they addressed directly what Ben and Rock uh, suggested about the mandibles, and then they did some pretty cool methods. To test these hypotheses, we digitized two-dimensional sliding semi-landmarks and samples of Gorilla, Pan, Pongo, and Homo, as well as MH1 and MH2. We document large amounts of shape variation with an all-extant species, which is related neither to ontogeny nor sexual dimorphism. Extant species nevertheless form clusters in sh uh, shape space as well as, or albeit with some overlap, the shape differences in extant taxa between individuals in relevant age categories are minimal, indicating that it is unlikely that ontogeny explains the differences between MH1 and MH2. So what they're saying is, yeah, we don't think there's too much compelling evidence that this is, that the mandible difference, mandibular difference, is just due to sexual dimorphism, or is just due to ontogeny development. Um, the shape differ, uh, what did I say? Okay, similarly, the pattern between MH1 and MH2 is inconsistent with those found between males and females in the extant samples, suggesting it's unlikely that sexual dimorphism explains the differences. While the difference between MH1 and MH2 is large relative to within species comparisons, it does not generally fall outside the confidence intervals for extant intraspecific variation. Um, Based on these results, as well as contextual and uh, depositional evidence, we conclude that MH1 and MH2 represent a single species. And that, for, and that the relatively large degree of variation isn't due to neither ontogeny nor sexual dimorphism. So what does all that mean? It means we've got a very variable species, very similar to Homo erectus and Homo ergaster. That's what this paper supports. So no, this guy, these guys don't say that it's multiple species either. <sighs> Dragon standing. Guys, I'm so exhausted. I, I'm, you might see me change outfits here soon, because I might actually have to put the rest of this off until tomorrow. Which is a shame. I really didn't want to do this because now we're going to go through. Now we're going to go through the crania. Now the crania is kind of a big deal because there's a lot to it. Um, turns out your skull, your face is made up of a lot of different bones, and all those bones can be measured and compared to other bones that other organisms have. <sighs> So this is a very long paper, but we're going to go through the abstract first, and then we're going to skim the rest just so you can understand why it's so gut-bustingly stupid that Rock and uh, Roop, Rock and Roop, Roop and Sanford think that this is a ape skull. And when they say it, they don't mean it in the correct way. They mean it in the dumb way. So let's discuss this abstract. Uh, pop back to my abstract. There we go. Okay. It's getting late. Ooh, it's like, what time is it here? 2 a.m.? Australopithecus sediba presents a mosaic of both Australopith-like and homo characters. Pack it up, boys. <laughs> the preliminary account of the skull of Australopithecus sediba provided in Burger et al. 2010 is augmented here to include a comprehensive, descriptive, and comparative analysis of both qualitative and quantitative characters of the craniodental remains of the holotype and paratype specimens, Moab hominins 1 and 2. Newly recovered mandibular material, material attributable to the holotype specimen, including two unworn premolars, are also present here. Australopithecus sediba shares several cranial characters with other Australopiths, most prominent of which include Australopithecus 
or most prominent of which, sorry, included small brain size, marked globular block, robust zygomatics, and steeply inclined zygomaticoalveolar crest. <laughs> zygomaticoalveolar crest. Um, degree of prognathism, patent premaxillary suture, topography of the entrance to the nasal cavity, and the insertion of the vomer and nasal and narrow palate. Combined with the most cranial evidence, these confirm that the Malapa skeletons reflect an Australopith adaptive grade. At the same time, Australopith gasidiba shares numerous characteristics with specimens of early Homo, most prominent of which include its limited postorbital constriction, widely spaced temporal lines, medially positioned mandibular fossa, moderately defined superorbital torus, and Supra, supratoral sulcus, sorry, with expanded supraorbital trigon, unflared zygomatics, interior laterally oriented lateral orbital margins, interiorly positioned uh, anterior nasal tubercle, raised intermaxillary suture, small mandibular synthesis, and corpus, well excavated subalveolar fossa, steeply inclined lingual alveolar plane, weak superior transverse torus, and absent inferior transverse torus. You're welcome. In addition, the transition from Australopith to human or to Homo likely took place uh, piecemeal over hundreds or perhaps thousands of generations. Thus, the combination of the traits that likely characterize early Homo are recognizably larger as a result of the imperfect nature of our, of our available fossil record. Notwithstanding this, given the similarities shared between Australopithecus sediba and Homo, on present evidence, we favor the hypothesis that Australopithecus sediba lineage represents the most likely ancestor of genus Homo or a close sister group to that ancestor. Now, you're going to hear Stanning talk about how it's insane that no one's talking about how Australopithecus sediba is not likely the root of Homo, even though the first paper that was super comprehensive on MH1 and MH2 skulls, um, or, you know, craniofacial features, uh, like, has that in the abstract as a viable hypothesis. I don't know. Seems pretty, seems pretty transparent. Why do you suppose the creationists aren't that transparent? I'll let you muse on that, mull that one over. Um, yeah, so essentially we can go we can go through all of the minutia of this. I've actually scrolled through this in a previous video. It's going to come as an absolute shock to you guys. It is indeed a flooring fact of the matter that Standing for Truth just didn't go over that part of my video. Do you think it's because he can't say the words? Maybe. I can barely say them, but, you know, that doesn't mean I don't go over them and try to say them uh, to the best of my ability. What, I'm, what you're seeing me scroll through here slowly, I kid you not, are comparisons of every single minutia of Australopithecus sediba specimens MH1 and MH2 to dozens of other specimens of Australopithecine and members of genus Homo. Um, this is about as freaking comprehensive as you can get. Which is why, like, if Standing really wants to overturn all of this stuff, what he should do is go to school for it. Um, learn all the traits and debunk it from the inside out. Why do you suppose there aren't any creationist paleoanthropologists? I'll let you muse on that one for a minute, too. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, this is just, you know, it's a really good paper. So this talks about, um, let's see, is, is it going to be too much for us to go over all of this? I think it's going to. I don't think anyone's actually going to want to listen to me talk about the, the details of this. But for those who want to know, indeed, Australopithecus sediba is hideously mosaic. Here, let's see if we can center in on this graph here. Boop. Hold on. Yeah, so... That's a nice graph, or that's a nice table, but we want to go to the graph. Facial mask indices. So let's see where Sediba hashes out. Sediba, Habilis, Erectus. Sediba, Afarensis Africanus. So A has it more with Habilis, B has it more with uh, the Australopithecines. C has it all by itself. <laughs> D has it with yeah, D has it kind of on a slope with Habilis and Africanus. Well, isn't that interesting? And um, E has it with genus Homo. Oh, oh, that sounds pretty damn uh, mosaic to me. Talking about prognathism, that's the, the muzzle. The human muzzle is relatively short. Some, some of us have longer muzzles than others, but certainly not what we see in the likes of chimpanzees um, or older hominins. 
yeah, this is just this this paper is just really rough on on creationists. I've never seen a creationist in my life go over it. And I consume a lot of creationist content. I was called out in my comment section recently, um, because I, I very clearly do enjoy what I do. Um, with all this stuff. So like, comment, and subscribe. <laughs> like, comment, and subscribe if you like seeing more of it. Um, I'm trying to find, like, a nice conclusion. But I don't think we're gonna find something that's, like, supremely a nice conclusion. Let's see. Okay, here we go. We'll start here. Ah, you ready? <sighs> okay. For the present, the similarities shared between Australopithecus and Eba and early Homo are numerous. Which, when combined with the postcranial evidence, encompass distinct functional systems including mastication, locomotion, manipulation, and reproduction. Australopithecus sediba lacks, lacks the powerful masticatory apparatus that typifies other australopiths and possesses a highly flexible spine, alongside pelvic and lower limb segments similar to those seen in Homo. A hand with a long thumb and short fingers that are associated with a precision grip and Homo-like pelvic arrangement in a small brain species that indicates birthing large-brained babies was not the driver of pelvic evolution. That is to say, it was likely the bipedality that's kind of implied there. Um, while it is possible that these characters are sh that the characters shared between Australopithecus sediba and early Homo reflect considerable levels of homoplasy, we think it's more parsimonious to suggest that some or even most of these characters do truly align Australopithecus sediba more closely with early Homo than any Australopith yet discovered. We hypothesize that these shared characteristics demonstrate a close affinity between these groups. On present evidence, Australopithecus sediba represents a candidate Australopith. Look what I've what have I done? What have I done? I done goofed. Where was I? Um, okay, this conclusion is in line with that of Dembo et al. Uh, 2015, were in their best supported phylogenetic hypothesis, which was based in part on data gathered from Berger 2010, placed Australopithecus sediba as a sister taxon to a clade comprising early Homo species consistent with the hypothesis of Berger et al. that Australopithecus sediba might represent the ancestor of Homo or a close sister group to that ancestor. Not or notwithstanding the similarities with early Homo, we maintain that Australopithecus sediba provides an overall body plan that is an Australopith adaptive grade. This is based on the possession of such features as small brain and body size, narrow palate and mandible, high origin for the masseter, australopith-like post-canine tube cusps, relatively long forelimb with high brachial index, upper limb joint dimensions that are relative to those of the lower limb, and a relatively primitive calcaneus. On a philosophical level, we agree with the arguments of Wood and Collard er, regarding the conditions necessary to attribute a fossil to the genus Homo. Sediba clearly fails two of their six criteria, body mass and body proportion, should be more similar to humans than Australopiths, and quite probably fails on a third, showing obligate bipedalism with limited climbing ability. What they're saying here is that <laughs> Sediba may have been an obligate biped, but it was also just really sick in the trees. Derived character, blah, 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 blah. You, you guys get the point. I mean, I could go through this all day. I'm going to put it in the, um, I'm going to put it in the comments because, or in the description. I think people just, you have to appreciate the sheer gravity of a paper like this. This kind of work is so ridiculously comprehensive. So it's no wonder that creationists don't touch it. In fact, it's very interesting. This individual is indeed very mosaic. Todd Wood, who is a, not this Todd Wood, different Todd Wood, um, creationist Todd Wood, thinks that Australopithecus sediba is actually in the, um, in the human clade, thinks it belongs in the human, in the human hollow baromen, he says, which is very interesting. So, um, that's going to be an interesting one. So I think we can go here, um, to our window capture and say that the cranian facial skeleton are an ape. And by ape, I mean aren't ape to the exclusion of humans, of course. Um, we're also going to very quickly go over the dental morphology. Now, standing at some point in his video, I, God, I cannot for the life of me remember where it is. We're going to be going over it, I'm sure, at some point. But Standing for Truth does go over a point where he's like, even this prominent paleo expert, even this prominent paleo expert says that teeth aren't an all-encompassing means of determining the species of an organism. Yes, 
they aren't, but they're very, very, very good at doing it in conjunction with other features. That's that's the whole that's the whole point. That's that's literally it. You, you would think that that would be inferable from that, but I imagine it was a quote line from Contested Bones. So this discusses the dentition, the dentition or er, uh, dental morphology, and phylogenetic place of Australopithecus sediba. So this is from 2013, um, in, with that first big burst of papers. To characterize the fur, to characterize for the Australopithecus sediba hypodyme, we describe 22 dental traits in specimens of MH1 and MH2. Like other skeletal elements, the teeth present a mosaic of primitive and derived features. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> the new non-metric data then are qualitatively and phonetically uh, compared with eight, those in eight other African hominin samples before cladistic analysis using a gorilla outgroup. Very good practice. There is some distinction largely, dri largely driven by contrasting molar traits from East African Australopiths. However, Australopithecus sediba links with Australopithecus africanus to form a South African Australopith clade. These specimens, or sorry, species present five apomorphies, including shared expression of Carbelli's first upper molar and the protostylid first lower molar. Five synapomorphies are also evident between them and the mono monophyletic Homo habilis, Rudolfensis, and Homo erectus. Finally, South African Australopith and Homo clade is supported for four shared derived states, including the identical identical LM1 cusp 7 expression. It's mosaic. The teeth are mosaic. And that presents an additional problem for Stanford and Roop. Oh god, did I not switch back over? I did it, did I? Okay, well, I, I'm not going to go back. I was reading from a paper on dental morphology. It's a good one. I'm going to show it to you in a second. But this creates additional problems for Sanford and Roop because wouldn't you know it, get our pink out here. Hello, pink? Hello, pink? Um, yeah, there are teeth in the upper mandible. And by upper mandible, I mean the maxillary teeth. Ta-da! Wow, teeth up there. So if the teeth are mosaic um, and the skull is mosaic, then you can't really say that the cranial facial skeleton are ape. But then... Roop and Sanford aren't paleoanthropologists, are they? Nope, they aren't. Oops, we, you know what, we're just going to keep all that. because. Okay, now, last but not least, for this hodgepodge episode, not assessed are the lower limbs and feet. Take a guess as to why these aren't assessed. Chat amongst yourselves in the chat. Will Stein, switch us over here. Boop. Okay. <laughs> this is the paper that I just read from, by the way. Um, a 2013 paper. Luckily, I only read the abstract. That would have been bad if I'd read longer than that. Um, let's see here. This was on teeth, or sorry, skull. Ah, hmm. This is an excellent paper. Boy, let's read it. The Lower Limb and Mechanics of Walking in Australopithecus sediba. 2013. Okay. The discovery of a relatively complete Australopithecus sediba adult female skeleton permits a detailed locomotor analysis in which joint systems can be integrated to form a comprehensive picture of gait kinematics in the late Australopith. Here we describe the lower limb anatomy of Australopithecus sediba and hypothesize that this species walked with a fully extended leg and an inverted foot during the swing phase of bipedal walking. Initial contact of the lateral foot with the ground resulted in a large predatory torque around the joints of the foot that caused extreme medial weight transfer, hyperpronation, into the toe off phase of the gait, late pronation. These bipedal mechanics are different from those often reconstructed for other Australopiths and suggest that there may have been several forms of bipedalism during the Plyo Pleistocene. Now, this, I know we have a zone around here somewhere. Mm -hmm. Let's go over here. Oh, maybe I did, maybe I'd already, maybe I had already jumped away from it. Um, either way. Yeah, so what this paper does is it's basically like, yeah, we've got some weird bipedalism going on. And it's nothing like what we see in any of the other hominins or in genus Homo, which what would that suggest, do you think? To me, that means that the, the, the hypothesis, the only hypothesis that's been continuously supported this entire time, the one where Belshopothica sediba represents a sister clade to uh, early genus Homo, well, that seems to match up. We've got weird specializations. We've got this weird retained uh, suspensory ability. Um, 
yeah, I don't know, it checks out for me. I'm relatively convinced on that. But certainly the reason why our, our boys, um, Sanford and Rube, didn't touch on this is because, lo and behold, we've we've got what is certainly going, is, is like an inline big toe with hyperpronation. Like, much more similar to, to um, like, this is just a bipedal animal. I'm so sorry. I'm exhausted. I really need to go to bed and finish this tomorrow because you guys aren't going to like my... My content if it's bad. Okay, the fourth metatarsal. This is worth zooming in on. Hold on. Okay, so fourth metatarsal. And boom. Okay. Stratopithecoid, so that's gonna be your ground monkey, ground old world monkeys, the gibbons, gorillas, pan, homo sapiens, uh, AL333, STW, UW, and OH. The curvature in the base of the meta fourth metatarsal and fossil hominins, apes, humans, and monkeys. Humans and most fossil hominins, including Australopithecus afarensis, have flat bases consistent with a stiff and immobile midfoot. Australopithecus sediba fourth metatarsal has a convex base, upper and lower qualities range, and outliers for each group, blah, blah, blah. Digital renderings of the fourth metatarsal in medial view illustrating the dorsal plantar dorso plantarly curved base morphology in apes and Australopithecus sediba, and the flat base in, all in other hominins and modern humans. So, this is Sediba, a chimp, a gorilla, curve, curve, human is very straight. Sediba is relatively straight, um, straight and presumably very straight. This is a biped, for sure. This animal's a biped, especially combined with the, um, the nature of the long bones. So, the reason why, if it's not evident, hold on, let me just, boop, there we go. The reason why, if it's not evident, Sanford and Rube don't really touch on the limbs and feet, at least not nearly as much as everything else, or at all to my knowledge, but I can't remember, and it's also late, is because this femoral head right here fits in the acetabulum of the pelvis, which again, if you'll remember correctly, can be heavily associated as it's in uh, close, close proximity and um, association with the vertebral column, which is in great association with the rib cage, um, and this, of course, matches over here, which is an associate. This, these uh, vertebrae here in association with the arm. You basically, if you include the lower limbs, y you get two hominin individuals. And if you were to accept these as two individuals of one species, you've got an ape man. So it definitely makes sense why they didn't include it, especially considering just how much material this is. Look at this. You've got most of this leg. You're missing the um, you're missing the distal femur, right? And you're missing the fibula. But you've got great tibia. You've got great femur. You've got an excellent femur here. Um, some tibia down here. Uh, a little bit of fibula over here. Ankle, calcaneus. Like it, you just have this really excellent representation. So why don't they touch on them like that much or at all? To my, you know what? We, I I keep saying this, but I could just check for myself. Even though I did include this this list is because, to my knowledge, they aren't assessed. But we, you know what? We can just check. Sadiba's human hand. Woohoo. Okay. Let's double check. Listen, you guys know I do this for you. I do this for you and because I'm petty. No lower limb, hip bone, hand. Skull and brain case. Still no lower limb. Nope. No nope, lower limb. No lower limb. So, why no lower limb, standing? Why no lower limb, Roop and Sanford? Um, it's because it's really problematic. So, so, I think we have assessed this portion of Standing's argument quite well. We have considered just now what it would be like if Bin and Rock indeed are correct, which is to say the only thing that would be out of the mix are these lumbar vertebra and the mandibles and even not considering them. We still have what is a very robust um, two hominins. Let's back that up. Um, okay, well, that's mostly gone, but let's see here. Uh, we'll redux this. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. And get rid of these. You still have two full hominins. Remember the thing about repeating mirror images. Um, and Sanford and Roop are completely garbo. So, no matter how you hash it, no matter which source of standings you use, you end up with two hominins of a unique species at the Malapa site.
What are you going to do about this standing? Please present viable reasoning as to why we shouldn't consider these as two species of a unique, or two specimens of a unique species of hominin. Explain to me the nature of, there, let me, let me get big brush mode. Can I do big brush mode? Wait, yes I can. Boom. Explain to me the nature of the spine and jaw. Explain to me why Bin and Rock and their unpublished work are correct and everyone else isn't. Explain to me the nature of the hip that's mosaic, the rib cage that's mosaic, the upper limbs that's mosaic, and the hands that are mosaic, and the crania that's mosaic, and the non-assessed limbs and feet. Because, my pal, standing for truth, if you don't do that, you're really half-assing this. You're really half-assing this overturning of evolutionary theory. Um, because even if you think the genetics are the only thing that matters, the bones are still there, and they still demand an explanation. So you can even be like, ah, yes, oh, the genetics support me, even though, as you'll find out tomorrow, they don't, but you still have to explain the bones. You have to go through them as systematically, I hope, as I did for you. I hope that you'll offer me the same courtesy, since you do plan on having the last word on this one. But, you know, I to me, at this point, the only adequate way to respond to this, since you've ignored my previous like deep dive, would be to go in and systematically cover every single paper that I just did. You know, like I do for your videos. Um, on this note, I'm bedraggled and tired, so I'm going to go to sleep, and you will see me... Um, Shortly, to you it will seem like a minute, like not even a second. To me, I'll be sleeping for 12 hours, and by 12, I mean 5. <laughs> um, okay, and then we'll continue. We'll continue on with our standing video.